I'm Dr. Earl Mawad, Vice President of Education for One Pulse Foundation. Our mission is to create and support a memorial that opens hearts, a museum that opens minds, educational programs that open eyes, and legacy scholarships that open doors. If you ask me what I'm most proud about being at One Pulse, it is the opportunity that we have to award scholarships to honor the lives of those that were taken. To date, we have awarded more than 900,000 scholarships to undergraduate and graduate students, and they are carrying the hopes, dreams, and aspirations of our 49 angels. Now, to our friends joining us for the very first time, I'd, wel I'd like to welcome you to our conversation starter. These film screenings and panel discussions are intended to spark conversations on topics that often fall below the social radar. For instance, the last screening was the short film, Love is All You Need. That film explored a world where LGBTQ was the norm and straight was unaccepted. Talk about establishing a sense of belonging. So that opened up some eyes as to what it is, what, what does it mean to, to belong in society? Now for our returning friends, I'd like to welcome you back and thank you for your continued support. That's greatly appreciated by all. We also want to thank the following sponsors for their support in making these presentations happen. We thank J.P. Morgan Chase and Company, and we'd also like to thank Orlando Utilities Commission. And now I'd like to introduce you to our education program specialist and tonight's program facilitator, Andres Acosta Ardila. So please join me in welcoming my co-pilot and friend, Andres. Andres, it's on you, my friend. Thank you, Dr. Earl, for that amazing introduction. My name is Andres Acosta, and I am the Education Program Specialist for the One Pulse Foundation. We're really happy that you joined us today for our conversation starter series uh, as we try to dive into topics that are often overlooked or just really not discussed within our community. Uh, we have an amazing film for you today, and I, it is my honor to introduce the filmmaker, Neil Lloyd. How are you doing? You okay? Uh, thank you very much for joining us today to watch SAM. Um, it's a film that explores sexuality and disability, and we hope you enjoy it. Cheers. Sam! Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Great. We've been trying to call you all day. I thought I told you about him. He's bad news. I like him, all right? Hey. Very nice. Hey. You don't want to ever take your breath away. I'm not gonna kill every second that with you. I'm in. What are you playing on? I'm in. I'm just a rude ass. I could give a piece of me to everyone I meet. No, I love the taste of the unknown. We hope that you enjoyed the film SAM. It's a wonderful, touching story that when we saw it here at One Pulse, we knew we had to see it and have a deeper conversation on it. So here for our conversation starter are our great panelists, starting with Beck the Tramp from Basically Wonderful. Uh, Beck is amazing. They are the founder of Basically Wonderful, which is an organization that focuses on the intersection of queer and LGBTQ+. Uh, we also have joining us again is Neil Eli, our wonderful filmmaker and creator of SAM. And then we also have Kenny Fries, who is an amazing writer uh, who really focuses on culture of remembrance and has a really great point of view on this topic. So we're grateful to have you all here today. And let's get started with the first question, which is just uh, the foundation for this whole conversation, which is why is it essential to show queer representation of people living with disabilities? And we can start with you, Neil, since you were the filmmaker for the film. <clears throat> I mean, I think it's one of the one things that we're still not really seeing much of, like on, on TV and film. Um, I, it felt to me, I was working with, there's a group in England called Mencap, 
um, who work with young adults with learning disabilities. And I'd been working with them for almost 10 years. <clears throat> and I think discussion came up again and again and again, and again that, you know, we're not seeing um, disability and sex, well, disability really representation on screen isn't seen, um, especially people with learning disabilities. Um, and when it is, they're kind of seen coming, say a few lines, taken away again, not having their own storyline. We're not seeing, you know, people with a learning disability can can lead, you know, as full a life, as as um, a traumatic a life, as uh, wonderful, as crazy, as, as any any life as what we all can live. Um, yeah, so, and then, and then on top of that, I think sexuality still seems to be very taboo for people with learning disabilities and, you know, being able to, to talk about it. I, I, I myself am a neurodivergent um, writer, um, I have ADHD, so I will fiddle, I will, like, probably interrupt, I will ramble, I will probably just get up and go and make a brew while you're in the middle of talking to me. Um, I try I try not to do that, but I, I do do things like that. So, yeah. Yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah. Is yeah. It answers the question and it lets us know a little bit about your process. And something that I forgot to mention to the viewers at home is that uh, this is actually a film from the UK. So we were, you probably already noticed from the accents in the film, but we were really excited to actually be able to have somebody from across the pond come and help uh, do this conversation starter. Um, so I'll throw the question over to you, Beck. Yeah, do you mind saying it just one more time, just refreshing? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. So the question is, why is it essential to show queer representation of people living with a disability? Hmm. Yeah, I really like Neil's answer about how both of these communities in and of themselves aren't represented uh, in media very well. Um, and the intersection is something that I think both communities alone could could use a little more of. Um, like within the disabled community, there isn't a lot of talks about being LGBT. And then within the LGBT community, there isn't a lot of talks about being disabled. So I think any chance that we get to have representation of that like intersection, because there is a lot of that intersection, I think that that's something that is very often overlooked is that there's a very natural intersection of these two communities. And for some reason it is ignored, <laughs> even though like a third of the LGBT community identifies as disabled. So it's like wild to me that it's not represented more. So yeah, I just think it's wonderful because it's, yeah, it's so natural. It's just, it happens more often than people think. So why not talk about it more? Absolutely. And Kenny, I'll throw this last one over to you if you have anything to add. Yeah, sure. I mean, the the simple answer is because uh, queer people with disabilities exist, so they should be represented. But um, I just, um, I mean, the last weeks I curated a big exhibit here in Berlin, where I live, uh, uh, Queering the Crip, Cripping the Queer, which is the first international exhibit on queer, uh, queer disability history, activism, and culture. And uh, it's the the parallels between historical, um, uh, you know, historical medicalization of disabled and queer people, and throughout history, there's been there are a lot of similarities in the in the in the history. So I think it's really important to see that that intersection. And what people don't really realize a lot is that you know disability is an intersectional identity. You have people you know of, of cross generations, across sexualities, across genders, across class, um, across races. And so to have a full, you know, full representation of the spectrum of queer people, you need to have representation of, of queer people with disabilities. Absolutely. And I couldn't agree more. I think one of the most impactful things about the film, too, is that it really looks at the way that people with disabilities not only see themselves, but are also aware of the way that the world sees them. Uh, one of the most impactful moments is actually when Sam and Sam uh, are talking on the swings and uh, the lady comes up to tell him, like, you know, get off the swings. And uh, Sam actually is aware of how people see him with a disability and actually uses that to kind of get her to back off. So that was a really just 
insightful moment, right? And the fact that people with disabilities see how the world sees them and, and are aware of that. And sometimes when we have representation, we just don't see enough of that representation being, being shown the way it should be. Um, with the fact that we are an intersectional community, the queer community, right, and the disabled community, what kind of challenges do you see, Kenny, uh, that queer people, that people with disabilities face within the queer community? Um, what, was, what was really interesting about the film for me was that um, that we were dealing with um, with a with a learning dis a learning difference, not not a a, a physical disability. Um, and usually, when we see <laughs> representations, we see it, we see it as as a as a physical disability. And I think that presents a similar but a different pro different challenge than 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 usual, um, because you know basically you're dealing with in, in most especially I'm going to talk for you know for gay men you know you're dealing with this you know the perfect the body ideal, and so a, you know a disabled person usually does not fit into this this body ideal, which is an ideal which I usually put in quotes because it really doesn't exist <laughs> these ideals, and so. Um, what was really nice to see in this in this in this film was that it was a it was a learning disability which is a different it, it's similar but it has a different aspect to it no uh, absolutely and we even saw that the film addresses the infantilization of sam even the way that his friends treat him right so they're overprotective and then a little bit overbearing and when they see him talking to his boy they 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 immediately feel defensive and protective instead of thinking like, hey, he's he's got a crush on this boy and he's talking to him, which is one of the first lines he says on the film is I've got a crush on him. Uh, Beck, tell you your your organization is amazing. You know, you've really focused on on bringing this this conversation of disability into the forefront. Uh, for those of you that aren't aware, one of the uh, Beck's programs is called Disability is Not About Word. And when I heard it, it really was uh, revolutionary to me, right? Because for a while, the conversation was was all over the place with that. It's like, do we use the word disabled? Do we not? And I like that you're empowering and in, in the forefront and saying, like, this is not a bad word. And this is how we identify ourselves. So with your organization being in that intersection of queer and, dis and disability, um, what challenges do you see that the queer community, uh, that the disabled community faces within the queer community? Um, oh man, <laughs> it's hard to think of one answer, <laughs> um, but I will say that one of the biggest things is that space just isn't made for disabled people in, in the queer community, um, particularly pride spaces, um, just like, a, like a particularly in-person events are not are not suitable for disabled people. Um, and it's it, intentional space isn't being made. Um, it's very much an afterthought, which is so unfortunate. Um, I, a, a lot of times disabled people have to create their own spaces to be able to celebrate and be a part of these communities that they know they're a part of, but they have to do it themselves. Um, and there's a, a lot of isolation involved in it um there's there's ableism everywhere but it's hard to see it from your own communities um because yeah like i said it, it it's really isolating um but yeah one of the things that we try to do with basically wonderful is again celebrating those intersections like we try to make our disabled spaces lgbt friendly and then our lgbt spaces accessible to celebrate those intersections because it's doing an injustice if you do it any other way, so. Very well, but very well put back. Uh, I'm also aware of some of the things that you've done here in Central Florida to advance that. And, you know, I just gotta say thank you uh, because you really are doing a really good work. Uh, Neil, this next one's for you. So uh, in creating this film, what did you learn about communities with disabilities? Like, what was the process like and how did it get you more connected to that community? <clears throat> um, well, I, 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 we made this film in 2000 and, I want to say, 18, yeah, 2018. Um, 
but I started working with people with learning disabilities in when I was 18 years old. So I'd worked with people within the I'd worked with people with learning disabilities for nearly 20 years um, as a support worker, uh, as a, a, a teacher. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's difficult to say what the what the film um, helped me to learn. Um, because I've I've kind of grown up around people. I'm 41 years old now, and I started working as a support worker at, at 18. So you know I've worked with people with a range of disabilities, so many different people on the spectrum for so long that yeah, uh, that's, it's a difficult question to answer. I suppose I see everybody's being person centred, so it's not about learning about a community as a whole I feel like I'm part of that community and I suppose I, I meet really interesting people and yeah so yeah, I, don't, I don't know what the film helped me learn I think I think the the one thing that I learned from the film that is that the um that the people without learning disabilities seem to have a bit of a problem with it like we had a lot of feedback and people saying is this grooming because you have someone who appears not to have a learning disability in the taller Sam and then you have you know the other Sam who physically you can see that he has a, a, a learning disability because <clears throat> he has Down syndrome and is, is this acceptable should they should they be engaging in a relationship and I think there was a lot of having to explain that both characters have capacity. Do you know what I mean? They're both able to make their own decisions. And also, who's to say that, that the other Sam doesn't have a learning disability as well, like, just because he doesn't look like he's got one. Do you know what I mean? So you're judging people off how they look like. <clears throat> so, yeah, I, I learned that people are a lot more ignorant as to um, the community than what I thought there was because I'd been, I'd been, I'd grown up in... A community, I suppose, where people had a really good understanding of people with learning disabilities because it was my job, and so I was surrounded by colleagues who also had that similar understanding as well. So yeah, ignorance probably was the. I, mean, I was a bit shocked by how ignorant people were. And let's unpack that a little bit, right? Because that goes back to that whole infantilization of people living with disabilities, right? Where People actually said to you, like, the word grooming, as in, you know, Sam is somehow unable to make a decision or feel any romantic uh, entangled uh, emotions. Yeah. So, Kenny, I saw that you made a face when he made that comment. Care to elaborate? Yeah, I mean, it's just, <laughs> I'm kind of amazed that people actually have that, 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 uh, that opinion because it's very clear that um, actually if you're going to if anyone is grooming anyone, which is not really what's going on, it would be the disabled Sam, the grooming, the grooming the other Sam, because he's the one who is clearly, you know, he's the one who, as you pointed out, says right at the start, you know, I, I have a crush on him. He's the one that kind of makes the moves in a lot of ways. And he seems in a, in a, in a way more comfortable in his sexuality than the other Sam. Um, so that's a real, I don't know that I don't know where people are coming from with that. I mean, they're really coming in. It looks like with pre preconceived notions and their own ableist bias on this. And again, as you pointed out, this whole infantilization, which you get not only from the friends, but you get from the, the from from Sam's father. Um, you know, always wanting him to you know taking him away from the swing and calling him all the time and stuff. So, yeah, that's really kind of disturbing that people have reacted that way. Yeah, and that, I mean, that shows us a lot of why films like this are important because I, I found it really special that Sam was the one that made the move, right? So he's the one that starts asking about, you know, what girl do you find attractive and everything, which anybody that's gay has played that before or anybody that's attracted to the same gender has played that whole, like, so, you know, who would be your girl? Well, just, mm -hmm. just trying to figure out, like, oh, are they either playing for my team? So I thought that was really, really well done. Um, let's talk it was, about it was, sorry. <clears throat> it was interesting actually because now, now I'm thinking about the amount of conversations that we had where people would then say, Oh, you know, maybe it's just that, that, um, that 
Sam that doesn't have the learning disability is too tall. Maybe you should have cast somebody who was shorter. That one was like, wait, hang on. So, so now it's about height. Like, so if that was a boy and a girl, like people wouldn't say, oh, the the boy's too tall for the girl. Do you know what I mean? Like, so it was. It then then became about what is it actually about? Is it about like some type of homophobia? Is it about like you, you're discriminating against people with disabilities? What what is your issue with it, really? Um, but yeah, I always remember someone coming back and saying you should have maybe cast somebody shorter to play the the role, so that it was the same height. Okay, right. <laughs> And, so and short people and tall people can't fall in love with each other. Uh, that's actually super interesting because that's definitely homophobia. Like that's flat out homophobia because we see that all the time where it's like, you know, older men date younger uh, women and nobody bats an eye. And then an older man dates a younger guy. And there's all this conversation about like, you know, is that appropriate? And it's like, it's done in the heterosexual world all the time and the height difference too. Like, uh, so thank you for bringing that up. Uh, <laughs> With the whole conversation of, of dating, right, and, and love and disability, um, let's talk a little bit about disclosure and discussing your disability when you date, because I think that's really uh, something to unpack there. You know, I'm a person living with HIV. Obviously, that's not, you know, that's different. Uh, but disclosure became something that once I turned 23 and I, and I became HIV positive, I had to constantly think about it. It's like, how am I going to tell people? So with people with disabilities, if you're on the apps or you're dating like that, like how does disclosure play into it, right? Uh, and Beck, we'll start with you. Yeah, so I think there's kind of an interesting parallel when you're queer mm -hmm. and disabled of having to kind of navigate like another coming out process. <laughs> it's like, a, it's an interesting parallel because like when you tell somebody that you're disabled, particularly when you have um, easily hidden or invisible disabilities where you kind of have to have that conversation. Um, it can be, it's like just as jarring and scary because there's this moment of like, you don't know how the other person's going to react when you tell them. Um, there is a very real possibility of rejection and it might change the way the person sees you. And those feelings are very much parallel to when you come out as queer or as trans, you know, those that the, there's just fear feelings, you know, that come along with it. So it's, it's a tricky process. There really is no one easy answer on when you should or should not tell somebody you're disabled or like how much you tell them. Um, some people don't, have the the privilege of keeping that information to themselves some disabilities aren't hidden um so but for me uh for the most part um it's not the first thing people know about me um i do use a mobility um device a, a mobility aid um most of the time i i have a cane or a walker um so when i do use those it is pretty obvious, but if um, like on dating apps, you wouldn't know just from looking at my profile, it is something that I either have to decide to disclose ahead of time, or I show up to a date with my cane and hope they have a good reaction to it. And uh, there's risk <laughs> with that, because again, the whole fear of rejection and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I, I'm not 100% sure where I'm going with this, but essentially, <laughs> Essentially, it is it is really scary because I've I've had people who I've I've just closed ahead of time and they didn't want to move forward with with dating because it's like a deal breaker for people I guess, um, and then I've had people that I didn't tell ahead of time and I did just show up to the date with a cane and they were like, cool, just yeah. new information, awesome, not a big deal, and it's just like such a mixed reaction. But either way, it is so extremely difficult because yeah just that fear of rejection that like it's 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 one of those things that you you can't change about yourself you you can't like 
if, even if I showed up to a date without my cane, I'd still be disabled. Like, <laughs> you know, it's still there. Um, so it just, it, it does make things significantly harder knowing that somebody could reject you like solely off the basis of just you're disabled. Like, and that's, that's it. Like nothing to do with my character, nothing to do with who I am as a person. It's just how I have to live my life. And it's, mm. uh, it, can, it can be disheartening sometimes, but, um, but there are good people out there and those are the people you want to hang out with anyways. So like, you know, <laughs> sometimes the rejection's okay. Cause then it's like, cool. I don't want to hang out with you then if that's how you feel great. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's difficult, but you find the right people. Yeah, and thank you for for sharing that. And definitely, I can I can see the the fear of rejection, and just the I mean, we're all we all have that to some level. But with a disability, is one of those things that, like you mentioned, you know, people are holding something against you that you have no control over. Uh, so, Kenny, if I'm not mistaken, uh, you are a person living with a disability, correct? Yep. Uh, and you're also married. Yes. So, <laughs> so Oh, that right. So, like, you successfully found a relationship and everything that that obviously someone that accepts you for for who you are. Uh, what was the dating process like? A little bit uh, before then, right? Have you faced the same things that Beck has mentioned? I mean, um, I mean, uh, I've rarely been single in my life. Um, so, um, I mean, I've been together now with my husband almost eighteen years. Um, but um, even previous to that, I was usually in in a long term relationship. I think there's been three years of my adult life where I haven't been. Um, I mean, I've written a lot about this in, in my books. Um, and what I've come to is um, and of course, you know, I grew up in a world with I'm older than I look and I grew up in a world be way before apps. Um, and so usually the meetings happen in person. So um, you can't see my disability because because uh, I'm, I'm I'm not my upper body isn't disabled, um, which has been a very interesting thing during COVID when everything moved to Zoom. Um, and uh, but if I'm out in the world, it's clear that I that I have a physical disability. Um, but when you're on an app, you don't really have to you you can you can disclose what you want to disclose. And over the years, what I've learned for myself, and this is really only to protect myself, is that I don't want to go into a meeting with somebody without them knowing I have a disability. It's just for my sake, nothing to do with them. I don't want to deal with that moment of surprise or whatever it, it comes to. I mean, I really, in my life, because of being disabled and you know that's not very many considering how long I've been on the planet so um but it's more to take control on my end uh to that I at least I don't have to deal with it I've told them what I want to tell them and if they're gonna if they're gonna say well we're not gonna meet or they're gonna ghost or disappear fine you know but um I don't want to have the thing of somebody coming in and meeting them wherever it is um, and them having to deal with that on the spot. That's just something I don't, I don't want to deal with. Other people will think it's fine, but it's, you know, it's something I wrote about in my first book, Body Remember a long time ago. Um, it's, of course it's different, but you know, there are people that just want a blonde, want a blonde person. <laughs> and you don't, you, you don't know, you're not blonde or as we were talking earlier, you want somebody that's tall or, and so, and that's also not your quote unquote fault. Um, so, you know, I know that disability has more of a, you know, we carry so much in the society, uh, we internalize so much that it's, it's, it's of course somewhat different, but um, it's just a, an old boyfriend of mine um, once used the word for my disability as a physical fact. And if we can just see it as a physical fact, then that's, that's what it is. Um, and as Beck said, you know, who wants to be involved with somebody that's going to make a big deal over it anyway? Um, so, um, but it's really, I, I've decided to take control of it and let people know before, before we actually meet in person, because then it's like, I told them what I'm saying. I kind of, I should copy it. I realize because I just have this little thing that I say, and that's that. Um, and then they make of it what it is. 
you know, that's really interesting to me. Thank you for, for sharing that. Just because I see the parallels that that are there between, you know, disclosing your disability and like in my case, disclosing your HIV status, which is something that I've become so loud about that at this point, like, if you don't know, I have it, like, you just really don't know me. Uh, and that way it becomes one of those things, like, if I'm upfront about it, it's not something you can use against me later. Um, and so with the similarities, let's also talk about something that, you know, in the HIV world, we always have to talk about, like, how do we challenge people's romantic biases, right? So how do we challenge people and let them know, like, this is something that I live with. It's not something that defines me. Uh, and how do you do that in the disability realm, right? So how do you challenge uh, romantic biases of people might have towards people living with disabilities? And can you even do that? Want to take it back? <laughs> I'm not sure if I have a good answer. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know if I have a good answer. I'll just say that, like, I don't know, for myself, like, I don't know, I'm not like, hiding that I'm disabled. I, I'll, I'll say that as like a caveat to what I said before about not being sure when to disclose with my with my work that I do. Now that's kind of my icebreaker into letting people know that I'm disabled is like, oh, I work like, like my work is disability related. It's peer led <laughs> disability related. It's very much implied now. So I, it's, it, I, it's not something I hide, um, but it's also like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know if I have a good answer to that question other than just, I, I don't know. I exist and I, I keep trying <laughs> to be out there and like, I'm not, shy about my intentions when I'm out there trying to date and just like existing as a normal person and I feel like that's the best that like an individual can do is is just continuing to to be themselves and, and putting their best foot forward and like I don't know non-disabled people interacting with disabled people is the best way for them to to uh, unlearn their own biases so hopefully there have been people out there it's like oh you're disabled you're also cool awesome so disabled people can date cool so i don't i don't know i don't know if i have a good answer but yeah those are my initial thoughts <laughs> no and thank you that, that was a good answer right because on a personal person level that really is the best thing we can do so i only brought it up because the film kind of challenges that and we saw it in the way that Neil replied that people actually gave negative feedback because they saw a person with disability dating so obviously there is that that bias that exists that that makes people somehow think that they are excluded from the dating pool, you know. Uh, Kenny, do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean you don't um, you don't see. Um, I'm trying to think of where and where in, in in you know in culture we've seen you know disabled pe you know people disabled people in love um, and. Uh, in all of the disabled movies, even in the good ones, like Gabby's story, which is an Argent Argentinian movie, um, was not queer, but it was, you know, a, dis a disabled main character. You always have the stereotype of being rejected in love by a non-disabled person. Um, probably the most clear one was, was just disability was was my left foot, but the Daniel Day Lewis character is um you know, is is rejected by the by the the woman. Um, so you always see that, but you don't see you don't see something. I mean, here in this movie, and it's a short. I mean, I really would like to see a full version of this movie where, as next, you know, where does where do they go? What happens to this this burgeoning friendship relationship, whatever you you know you, how you want to term it? I don't know. honestly. I don't know how many people can change. Um, you know, we're so hardwired with sex and with love and all that stuff. People have so much expectations that they don't even know we have, you don't even know you have them. And so I wonder how much can change, but I think people can be educated to some respect, but I don't know how that would change somebody who clearly does not, you know, view a disabled person. As disabled. 
I don't know that effect and how much that changes. All right. And, and thank you for, for bringing that up. So, Neil, uh, we were actually talking about how do we challenge romantic biases that people might have towards people living with disabilities. And we mentioned that Sam was a perfect example of that, right? Because it literally shows you that people living with disabilities have romantic feelings and should be allowed to express them as such. And one of the comments that Kenny made right as he came back was that this should be made into a, a, a feature film. So we get to explore the relationship more between Sam and Sam. So we're, we're, definitely, we're definitely working on that at the moment. Um, I think the problem with the UK is that it's extremely, extremely, extremely difficult to get any type of funding. Like, I think, you know, you've got the BFI, you've got Creative England, but they tend to give their pots of money out to the people that they are in the same circles as. So whether or not it'll ever become a feature film, I don't know. We'd love it too. The, the script's there. Um, the, the, like you said, it, it definitely could explore much more as to what's going on in their home lives. Um, but yeah, yeah, we'll see. We definitely want to do that. But, but like I said, someone's got to give us some money first so we can go and make it. Right. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, I wish you the best of luck on that one. And if you do, then just remember that everyone on this panel would like an invitation to the premiere. <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. Right. Um, sort of <laughs> so the next question that I have is, um, how do we address stigma as a whole towards uh, people living with disabilities? And... Neil, you kind of did that a little by by doing exactly what you did, right? So you chose uh, to prominently feature a main character that is living with disability in a really in a romantic relationship. How else can we get around the stigma around disability? And we'll start with you if you have any. Me. <laughs> um, how else can we get? I mean, I think it's like everything, isn't it? I think the more that the more that people are educated. And the more that people see stories, like, you know, the media is a great way, you know, of putting things in front of people. Um, yeah, and the more more education, the more that we see stories on on TV. And, uh, you know, I think that that's a, a definite way to helping people to be education, really. I think it's just education, isn't it? Um, see, it's di difficult because I've grown up with people with learning disabilities. Like, literally, I... It's difficult to, I don't see people as having a disability. I see them as a, the person, um, you know. So, yeah, it's hard when you're, I suppose, in it to see what it's like from the outside view, if you get what I mean. Um, I can yeah. Yeah, no, that's, that's a good answer. And it's great that you've had that exposure your whole life. You know, my uh, my older brother, uh, lives with disability. He is on the autism spectrum, and it's it's noticeable enough that he's on disability. Uh, and so I've grown up all my life with it, and it's great to see these kind of conversations because honestly, for the longest time, like me and the family, always worried like, is he ever gonna find somebody? You know, like how do you help someone date when they're living with a disability? You know, uh, yeah. especially when they rely on the family for everything else. Yeah. Uh, but back to the conversation around stigma. Kenny, can you give us some insight on that? Oh, I wish there was a magic wand and stigma would just go away, right? Um, I mean, I think it's a long process. <laughs> um, so I think putting the stories out there, but you have to be really careful because the media sometimes takes these stories and makes it into um, the old narrative of people overcoming disabilities um, instead of just living with a disability. And so you have to be careful that you um, that you craft the, the narrative in a way that that it can't be co-opted by, you know, by, the, you know, by, by media because they will do that and they constantly do that. Um, so I think having, I mean, one thing that was really great, I mean, it's clear um, that the, the, the actor who plays the disabled Sam is disabled himself, which is rare. I mean, it's becoming more, uh, you know, you know, it's happening more and more, but there's still, you know, the old joke of you play a disabled person, a non-disabled actor plays and wins an Academy Award for playing a disabled character. Mm -hmm. um, so 
So that's that's a really big step forward. Um, uh, is you know that the you see, my assumption still is when I go see a movie that oh it's going to be a disabled character the disabled person isn't going to be you know disabled. Um, I created something called the freeze test, um, which you can find online. Um, it's kind of like the Bechdel test for women, like how uh, a narrative should have to to pass the test. You know, and something you don't usually see is. Um, you don't see to pass the freeze test. You have to have more than one disabled in the narrative, and the uh, the the which is rare. <laughs> you see a disabled person in isolation. You don't usually see another you know, than one disabled person. Um, and the other two things, it's pretty easy to pass the test, but you'd be surprised. There's like not many things that do that do pass it. Um, the other ones are, you know, because it's late in the day here, I'm, I'm forgetting them. Um, but the second one is um, that uh, they actually talk to each other, the two disabled people. Um, we have the, the, for an example of where they don't, is in Cost of Living, Pulitzer Prize winning play, which just was redone on Broadway this past year. They do cast the two disabled characters with disabled actors, which everyone makes such a big deal of. But the two characters don't talk to each other. Um, so that's the other thing is that um, that the characters actually are not there for the enlightenment of the non-disabled character or the non-disabled audience. Rain Man is a perfect example of that. Um, the the disabled characters there's purpose is to is to you know is to educate the 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 the, uh, the, the Tom Cruise character. Um, and then the other part of the freeze test is that you don't kill or cure the disability. And that's that's the real trope that you you know that always happens is that you know the disability remains. It's not something that you you eradicate by either cure or by killing it. Million Dollar Baby is probably the big the big film about that, which which is based on a true story where the person is actually still alive. That this that it's based on, but in the movie Hollywood decided they had to kill the character. Um, so that's I think that's those are some ways you you fight stigma, but it's a long process. You're not going to have one film or one TV show and all of a sudden everything's going to be hunky-dory and, you know, and Beck and I can go out dancing and, and celebrate together, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, it's a process. Yeah. So, Beck, take it to a more local level, right? So, on a person-to-person, -person, on a community level, how can we fight stigma? I mean, at the end of the day, it's really up to the individual on whether or not they want to change how they view the world. And so to an individual, I would say um, just take in um, like content made by disabled people, not even not even just on a grand scale. Like we're talking about movies and, and whatnot. I like follow disabled people on social media. Listen to what they have to say. Like, like I think that people really underestimate um, how many disabled people are actually in their life. Um, and it's also really telling about a person if they don't know their friends are disabled when they are, because that means they're not a trusted person <laughs> in their life. Um, but I, I can I can pretty much guarantee that everyone knows like at least one disabled person, whether or not they know it. Um, they know at least one disabled person. So like, listen to your friends listen to disabled people like it's really easy to to forget a stigma and to break your biases by just listening to real people talk about real things um because you know we've been talking about media and and kenny brought up so many good points about the awful tropes in media but that's where people are getting their information they get their information from these really really bad tropes in media so it's yeah, listening to real people, following advocates on social media. Like, there's so many great people on Instagram, on TikTok. Like, it, it's readily and easily accessible information if you just look for it. Like, it's not hiding anywhere. <laughs> so, so that that's what I can say. And then, like, at, at a grassroots level, um, you know, supporting the organizations that are trying to do the work and um, just like I don't I don't know. I feel like it's, I feel, again, I feel like it's easy to understand what dis disabled people want and what their lives are like if you just, like, take the time to listen. You know, like, my organization makes spaces for disabled folks, so that would 
inherently tell you maybe these spaces don't exist already and that's why people are out there trying to make those spaces so it's like I don't know it's it's just I it just feels like such a, an easy concept I think I think one of you said at some point if you're if you're in the community, you don't know what it's like from an outside perspective. And I, I think, I think I feel that all the time. Cause for me, I'm like, it's so easy. I'm like, it's so easy, but yeah, it's easy for me cause I'm in it already. So like, yeah, of course it seems simple to me. So maybe it's not, it doesn't seem as simple to other people, but it's, it's not hard if you try to look for it, it's there. Like we're, we're ready to, to, to tell you what it's like living as a disabled person and, and trying to just exist like any other person like it's it's I can't believe it's such a wild concept that disabled people might want to just you know live their lives <laughs> it shouldn't be such a wild concept so no you're you're right and and I love that person to person thing like so we forget about the power of social media when it comes to that right because it it expands our networks and ultimately it introduces us to people that that have different stories. And when you follow disabled advocates on social media, you actually get to learn a lot about their lives. So go follow back on social media. Uh, so the last thing I'm gonna leave with is one, I have a question for Neil that I never asked before. And I was like, what is what does SAM stand for? Because when I read it, I was just like, oh, it's Sam. Like that's both their names, like it's Sam, you know? <clears throat> Um, so it, it's an anagram, but it, it does, apart from it being both of their names, it's an anagram. So it doesn't. It stands for whatever you want it to, really. And we always felt like it being secretly always mine, because oh. um, look, jo George um, and Sam kind of came up with all of the anagrams when we was doing workshops. So there's uh, she's always moaning, secretly always mine. Um, shoot, avoid, marry. Uh, 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 I just can't remember the rest of them. But yeah, they came up with a few. Um, so yeah. But it, it's meant to be that they're both called Sam. Okay. No, and I I love the secretly always mind. That's really that was really cute. Yeah. Because um, at the end he says no, it doesn't have to be a secret, I think, where Yeah. I've it, not I've not do you know what? it's weird because I've not watched it for so long that I don't I can't really remember what happens in it anymore. <laughs> Because yeah. I wrote the feature now, we're just um, I, I think of stuff to do with the feature, which is slightly different. So, but yeah, yeah. So I've I've watched it about ten times now because I had to oh, for this for to like get ready. And every time I found like a little piece, so it's it's fascinating to me how even when you watch a short film, if you only do it once, you kind of like gloss over some details, and the more you watch it, the more you're like, oh. They have so little time to tell a story that they have to be intentional about every single scene. So, really yeah. um, so we're actually about to wrap up. So, uh, Kenny, um, what's something that this film not necessarily taught you, but what are you taking away from this film? Well, it was really, I mean, I, the, the first thing was that, you know, that I, I mentioned earlier is that they're here with a disabled actor playing a disabled character. I mean, that really was really, really important. Um, also, the whole, um, you know, it's, a, it's usually, a, it's usually a, a something from the UK that happened. You know, the, the whole class difference was also really, really interesting um, because obviously, you know, they talk about where they live. One is on the posh side of the park. The other one is in the estate part of the, the park. And that's something that's, um, you wouldn't really get that in a US, in a US film. Um, which I, which, I, which I really appreciated. And then you start to look at, you know, what disables people, you know? Um, is it only, you know, physical or a learning difference? Um, but it's, you know, it also goes into class. And the scene with the mother was quite horrific. <laughs> I mean, she's a piece of work. Um, so, um, you know, it, it, for such a, sh it, it, it's so much, there's so much there in such a short time. And there can be so much there in a short time, which is you can imagine how much could be there in a in a longer time. So that those are just a few things that I that I took away. Thank you, Kenny. And Beck. Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything. Kenny, you said it so well. Um, <laughs> um, but I, I really did love to see a film that 
oops, sorry, my camera almost tipped over. Um, <laughs> but it was good to see a film that that represented the intersectionality and also like I don't know the just kind of the wholesomeness of uh, when you first start you know, talking to somebody you like and just, I don't know, I found, I found their interactions to be so cute. And uh, it just, yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed watching that, that part of the representation. Cause yeah, we don't, we don't see stuff like that this very often where it shows disabled people falling in love, even just like just in general, falling in love. And then when you add the queer aspect to it, it's like, yes, I'm rooting for you. So, um, <laughs> so it was just, it was just really nice to see. Perfect. Um, and thank you all three of you for joining us for this panel today. We are super happy that we're able to have this conversation. Uh, Sam is currently not available online. Uh, however, uh, Neil, is there plans for a release later on uh, here? Uh, when can our viewers hope to watch it again? Uh, yeah, so it should be available on um, a DVD collection by Pegadillo Pictures called Boys on Film. Okay. And I think it comes out in the summer, so June, maybe July. Um, but yeah, thank you for all of that lovely feedback you, you both just gave as well. That was really nice to hear. Thank you. And thank you all for joining us today. Uh, stay tuned because Neil is going to share a story about the film, um, and it should be funny, hopefully. Uh, <laughs> so... Um, Thank you for joining us. I'm Andres Acosta with the One Pulse Foundation, and please stay tuned for um, for our next conversation. Um, so yeah, so we were filming in a park in a council estate where I grew up, um, and we asked all the, the kids and the teenagers like if they wanted to be involved in the filmmaking. But I suppose that like, from my point of view, knowing I've grown up where I've grown up, it, it's kind of it is a bit of a a rough estate um so there was a little bit of nervousness like are we gonna get a little bit of trouble do you know what i mean are, you know you're gonna get kind of teenagers coming along like you know being teenagers and being noisy and that um so all weekend it went really well like we had teenagers come along we had loads of people from the the, the rough side of the park coming along getting involved making cups of tea and then on the last day it literally pissed down with rain we was like great and this one woman from the really posh side of the thing a really posh like well-to-do woman came with a squeaky bottle and every time we went to action she she squeaked the ball to make a dog start barking so like we was like are you literally are you joking like it'd be like add action and she'd go squeak squeak and so the dog would be like start barking like so yeah it was i mean it's not a funny story it's a really annoying one it was just going off the thing of like, we thought, you know, we'd probably get lads coming along on bikes and cuts on and being like, what are you doing? Uh, what are you filming? But no, we had absolutely like great time with, with those sides. And then this really fucking annoying woman coming along with a squeaky ball. Uh, yeah, that's it. It's not that funny, but um, it's just a memory, I suppose. <laughs>